It's important to to note that these these uprisings we've been seeing, uh, not in, in Tunisia, Egypt, and Yemen, Bahrain, uh, 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 Syria, and elsewhere, are are are, are not spontaneous. Um, in fact, many of these others are, are are as well. I mean, we often, you know, not, don't know these know about this kind of stuff until we, the cameras get there and you see hundreds of thousands of people on the street. But these come out of you know years of a protracted um, a struggle. Um, and you know, there, as many of you know, there's been a dramatic growth in civil society in Egypt in, in recent years. Um, you know, increasing ways of labor strikes, um, the um, ever larger um, pro-democracy uh, uh, um, uh, struggles, the general strike in April uh, 2008, which, you know, which gave the name of the April 6th uh, movement. Um, they, uh, you know, the, the increasing government repression, worsening economic conditions. Uh, you know, the parliamentary elections this past fall in, in Egypt, which were even more transparently uh, rigged than, than usual, um, led many of us to suspect that this, that you know, such an uprising uh, was only a matter of time. In fact, I, I had an article uh, published in early December, right after the parliamentary elections, where I, uh, I did predict that Egypt. Uh, would be the next country to have a uh, Serbian-style uh, nonviolent pro-democracy uh, insurrection. I mean, I was technically I was wrong because the Tunisians beat them to it. But um, it, you know, that, that you know, a lot of us who were you know, familiar with what was happening in these countries are not not totally surprised. This is something that had been you know, going. It was planned. You know, they they wanted. You know, they, they, they this this was. Um, um, some people didn't expect. I, including myself, didn't expect it quite as soon. But uh, this was, um, in many ways, it was a, a long time um, uh, a coming. And I, the underlying thing is that, that people want to be free. Um, that uh, um, despite our stereotypes in the West, Arabs and Muslims don't like to be um, uh, jailed or tortured or murdered for their political beliefs any more than Western Christians do. Um, that the form a democracy takes will certainly vary depending on the country's unique cultural and historical circumstances, but uh, everybody wants accountable governance. Everybody um, uh, you know, does want um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, political freedom and, and, and social justice. Um, that um, the um, and and what what's also gives me hope is that uh, you know unlike armed struggles with their martial values and their tradition of an armed elite uh, vanguard, uh, nonviolent movements because they rely on a broad coalition uh, representing uh, you know many segments of society because they include not just uh, young able-bodied males but you know men and women young and old you know, again big cross country uh, section of society. They require the kind of compromise and cooperation and coalition building that's really critical for for democracy. And again, empirically, uh, the, the, with a few notable exceptions, like Iran in '79, um, nonviolent overthrows of dictatorships tend to lead to democracies, whereas uh, armed revolutions that oust dictatorships more often than not result in another dictatorship. So. Um, what we're seeing, basically, is just in conclusion. Just want to emphasize that that democracy will come to the Middle East, I believe, but but not through foreign intervention, not through sanctimonious statements from Washington, uh, not through voluntary reforms by autocrats uh, or armed struggle by a self-selected vanguard. It's going to come, uh, you know, through the power of massive non-cooperation and with illegitimate society, and the strategic application of nonviolent action by Middle Eastern peoples themselves. Thank you. Well, Libya, Libya is interesting because th th they had their most dramatic successes in the first week when they were overwhelmingly nonviolent. That's when they took over over half the country. That's when you had the mass defections, you know, among the um, uh, you know military officers and and uh, um, 
and uh, ambassadors and uh, um, Gaddafi's closest aides and mistresses and everybody. Uh, that's, that, that's, that's when they seem to be on the, on the verge of, um, of, of, uh, of winning. And it was only after you know, taking up arms, essentially meeting Gaddafi on his strongest point, uh, that they, they started suffering defeats, and which then led to the uh, NATO intervention, uh, which has had a had vast and mixed success. Uh, um, and of course, that, 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 that plays into sort of Gaddafi's hands. Uh, I mean, you know, you know Libyans, um, the possible except, with the exception of the Saudis, are probably about the most xenophobic <laughs> peoples in the Middle East. And um, it's no accident that Gaddafi st stands beside the ruins of buildings bombed by the United States in the 1980s. And, so he plays on that legacy, and of course the brutal French, uh, sorry, br brutal Italian colonialism in the early 20th century. And um, sound of, uh, anybody know the first uh, uh, U.S. administration that intervened in Libya? Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> um, Stephen Decatur, the Barbary pirates, and the Marine him from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Um, that uh, that uh, that unfortunately, it, it, you know, it's really played in, in, in hands and, and consolidated his his. Um, his shrinking support. I, I don't think it's simply because, as some people say, he is more brutal and ruthless than the others. Like I say, um, Mubarak Ben Ali, any of these guys would have quite willingly massacred people if they thought they could get away with it. Mark, we now know that people like Marcos in the Philippines, Honecker in East Germany, they ordered massacres, and, but you know, people were, they were, uh, troops refused to obey their orders. Um, I think what's made it uh, more problematic in Libya is, is, for one thing, you don't have a regular standing army that you have, you have foreign mercenaries, you have um, um, militias that are, you know, through tribal or other kind of you know, loyalties are, are, are harder to break. Um, and, and indeed, it's a rentier state. To, to my knowledge, no, no classic rentier state has ever been overthrown by a, by a nonviolent struggle, which doesn't mean it, it couldn't happen, but it just makes it means it's, it's, it's much more of, a, um, more of a challenge. Of course, civil society, and uh, not coincidentally, is, is weaker in Libya. <laughs> Than it is in the other uh, other countries, uh, but you know I do think that um, I still think uh, I think they would be smarter, frankly, to to st stuck to a, a, a nonviolent uh, uh, path. Not and again, not making moral judgment. I, don't, I wouldn't. Make, I'm not a pacifist. I'm not, make, not, not and I would never want to judge how another people, you know, would fight for the liberation. But there's a lot more nonviolent action about masses of people standing in one place. You know that you. Just like a guerrilla army, you need to sometimes you need a tactical retreat, diversify, decentralize your tactics, consolidate your support, and come back and, 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 and using you know, more diverse tactics, et, et cetera. Um, I, you know, I think probably the smartest thing to do right now would be accept Gaddafi's ceasefire, uh, create a good model of, uh, of, of governance in liberated areas, and through a combination of uh, international sanctions of the uh, government held areas, you know, remobilize the uh, popular resistance. The nonviolent resistance inside uh, the Gaddafi controlled areas. One of my concerns right now is while the initial uprising, I think, it was as authentic a pro democracy struggle as, as in Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, and, and Syria and elsewhere, is that, uh, that, that some of the folks have con gone to the head of the arms struggle. Are, are these are uh, you know, people who were top military people or cabinet officers in Gaddafi's regime until a few weeks ago. One of them has, is a kind of sketchy character that's had CIA connections for at least 30 years. And uh, some of the veteran fighters happen to be these uh, Salafi uh, <laughs> types who were, are, had an armed struggle in the mountains against Gaddafi back in the 90s. In other words, people who aren't necessarily dedica dedicated to a new democratic order. Uh, so. Um, uh, that makes me a little nervous. I mean, even though I'd love to see Gaddafi fall as much as, much as anybody. So, uh, you know, Libya's a tough one. I mean, either way you look at it. Yeah. I, I guess the, the question that occurred to me is, what, what should the United States policy be mm -hmm. with regard to a strategic ally, which is an authoritarian government? Yeah. I mean, in, in Egypt, uh, when she was Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice made a speech about encouraging mm -hmm. democracy in Egypt, which apparently Mubarak was furious yeah. about and was furious at both her mm -hmm. and the Bush administration. Uh, the Saudis have been very resistant mm -hmm. to uh, uh, mm -hmm. exhortation. And these governments have also been very displeased mm -hmm. with US support through the institution that you mm -hmm. mentioned uh, in the yeah. past. Well, interesting. You know, Rice and the Bush administration in general reversed their policy pretty 
soon thereafter and refused to even say anything about Noor or others during, in, in subsequent visits. Um, and yeah, I, th I think they were stung by what happened in, in the uh, Palestinian parliamentary elections uh, with Hamas, even though that, you know, those of you know, who know Palestine, it was unique to that situation given the, uh, you know, corruption and, and autocratic rule of Fatah and the occupation and, you know, a bunch of other things. Uh, uh, it was certainly not emblematic of what would have happened, you know, elsewhere in the region. Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I think part of it is, is first do no harm, and I think not not you know, not providing the tear gas and the water cannons and the you know the kind of uh, of uh, uh, the security assistance that that's used to to repress um, you know the, the, these uh, um, uh, suppress pro democracy. I mean, think just making making security assistance conditional to um, um, respect for inter internationally recognized human rights is is, is critical. Um, so that, I think that that would be the main thing. Generally, I, I think given the history of the United States, of U.S. And, and the Middle East, I think it's probably better that we, we not be very act, uh, proactive. I mean, I think, think as, as much as I sympathize with the Green Revolution, I think that um, um, uh, uh, Obama was right and McCain was wrong in saying, uh, in, regarding how open the United States should have been in terms of supporting the movement because I mean, if you look at our history in Iran, we overthrew the last democratic government the country had back in the 50s. We uh, supported the Shah and his Savak and the brutal repression for a quarter century. We've, th we've threatened regime change, and we have uh, invaded uh, the countries on that, and to Iran's immediate east and west in recent years. So, you know, any, any kind of support for, um, you know, the you know, more open support for democracy struggle would play right into the regime's hands. And indeed, uh, the more genuine Iranian dissidents were upset at this, the, 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 what was it, 70 million dollars of congressional funding for two Iranian opposition groups. I mean, outside of a few, uh, a few Iranian, Iranian Americans in LA, I think <laughs> most people were pretty skeptical of that whole, whole project in the first place. So, um, so I, think, I think, again, given, that, given the history in the, in the Middle East, um, it, I think it would be better if the US took a more, more cautious, hands-off approach uh, simply because it could be used by autocrats to their advantage. I mean, this is different than Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, the U.S. was largely seen as a friend of democracy because the outside power supporting their oppression was the Soviets. But uh, in, in the Middle East, we're, we've been the main obstacle in terms of foreign powers and, and democracy. So uh, um, um, given that history, I think it, 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 it's, it's, it's best that we just do what we can to encourage civic space and, um, and then... Um, Hope that the, the people themselves can uh, can uh, uh, take advantage of that to, to move forward. Yeah. For years, you've been uh, an observer of the Moroccan scene and Algerian scene. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've seen for at least the last 10 years, the last 12 years, is that the, most of the political dissents within Moroccan universities, especially public universities, especially in Agadir, Marrakesh, mm -hmm. recently Rabat, is the Sahrawi's dissent. Mm -hmm. within universities. Recently, in post-Egyptian, post, especially Tunisian uprising, there has been a, an uprising within Tindu, mm -hmm. among the youth, mm -hmm. yeah. against the establishment of the, the, the Polish yeah. leadership. Mm -hmm. What's your take on 